ever notice how you keep saying yes to things you simply want to say no to? And then once you say yes, you beat yourself up asking why you've gone and done it yet again. This is actually something pretty common with a lot of us. Believe it or not, our subconscious makes decisions for us without us even realizing it. I'm Renya Dubey, and welcome to How to Be Less of an Asshole, a channel where self-awareness is the only answer to our problems. This podcast aims to look at human behavior through the lens of history to better understand how we've become the people we are today with hopes of inspiring you to do the same. Today I'll be talking with my friend Kirsten about how to manage the situations that we really want to be saying no to. I told you I've been talking to my parents and my brother about just the patterns that we have going on. And what I think is really interesting is that we're all aware of the things that we keep repeating over and over. Last week, I told you how I became aware of the fact that I don't like doing certain things. But the funny thing is, I'll go through something that makes me super uncomfortable. And then when someone gets in touch with me again, instead of telling them I don't want to do it again and just cutting it short because the person's not even really putting pressure on me, I panic And then I fall into the loop of doing it again, even though I've clearly outlined in my mind how uncomfortable and awful I felt doing it or dealing with a certain person. So that's what I want to talk through because this is something that I'm certain that other people are having to deal with because I'm actually hearing people say, why do I keep making the same mistakes over and over? when we're all clearly aware that we Mm -hmm. don't want to do those things. Mm -hmm. I remember someone saying one time something about, um, we all know how to lose weight, right? We all know that you eat less and exercise more. Super simple, but North Americans are overweight. So we know what we have to do. We don't do it. And I don't think losing weight is an anomaly. I don't think it's the only area where we know what we need to do, but we keep doing what we know we don't need to do what is not contributing to the thing that we want. It's an interesting question. I think it's a complex question. And I think that we, I mean, so much of what we do is done subconsciously, unconsciously. And as you've pointed to habits and patterns, right? Like we, we are very habitual creatures and we work along patterns. We even have grooves in our brain that information travels through that funnels us into that same place over and over and over and over again. So I think the complexity of it comes into when we ask why. So what was it in an earlier part of our life that caused us to develop those habits and those patterns? Because at some point, those things developed as a coping mechanism or a survival mechanism, but then later on became unnecessary, but we didn't recognize the moment when they became unnecessary and kept using them as coping mechanisms or survival mechanisms, even though they're not serving us in that same way anymore. So if we can identify that time in our history when we adopted this pattern or habit, that can help us to understand why and then help us to deconstruct it. And usually it's, um, I think, attached to an event or events that caused us to have a certain thought that then turned into a certain emotion, which caused us to have a certain reaction. And for whatever reason, that stuck. I think so commonly the answer to the question is self-reflection or self-inquiry. So in this particular case, I would probably start the process with asking myself questions as to where was the beginning? What was the moment that that behavior started or that pattern started? Oftentimes we can trace it back to one particular thing, probably sometime between the beginning of our memory and when we were maybe six or seven years old. Again, complex though, right? I think I know what it is because, like I told you last week, instead of facing the ending, I panic. And then I go back into the loop. But when I was 15, my first boyfriend, 
and we're friends nowadays, so it's totally fine to talk about it. But like in your relationship, he would break up with me and would leave me for someone else. And now that I think about it, that panic of the ending is the exact same feeling that I had with him when he would break up with me, basically. Okay, so can we... And now let's let's take that even deeper. Chances are, just guessing on the timeline, the age that you were, as you describe here, and the person who that relationship was with, I'm going to guess that that wasn't the beginning, that that was you, that you were already in a pattern or a habit when you agreed to the contract of that relationship. So... Is there a similar feeling or a a similar sensation, similar thought, similar process that you can think of that happened earlier in your life? Probably. I guess it would just be stuff with family where there was always a threat of someone leaving either the family mold or because There was a lot of tension in between my parents and my father's family, for instance. So we were always, and God forbid that they ever hear this, we were cast aside a lot by them. And you know what? It's because there was this idea that we weren't good enough to be part of the family, basically. Okay, so if you go back into those memories, is there a similar kind of end feeling? to that catastrophic kind of feeling sensation? Well, yeah, because there was a moment that we were cut off and that we never spoke to any of them again until 25 years later. Now there's one person talking to us from the family. So that's a big deal, right? So there's a there's something that happened there that caused a reaction inside of you that was unpleasant but probably became somewhat familiar because family um, dynamics cause familiar feelings, even if they're not good feelings. And then that gets stored in our subconscious or unconscious. It actually gets stored in the cells of our body and can really contribute to the formation of our personality and the formation of our habits that are, are really deeply hidden from us. And until we start that process of self-inquiry, become very difficult to see. An example for me, um, so I've shared with you that the the first memories of my life were when I was three and I had bacterial meningitis and I had to stay in the hospital away from my family, which hadn't been separated from my mom um, hardly at all so far at that point in my life. And so it was very traumatizing for me being being separated from them. And although there was no kind of abuse or anything like that, it triggered the beginning of separation anxiety for me. And um, an example of the perpetuation of this. So when I was in kindergarten, started school at that point, we went for a half a day. And my mom was at that point in my life, chronically late. She just had, she had three kids. She was super busy. She had a lot of responsibility and she was pretty much 10 to 15 minutes late for everything that she did. And so when it came to the end of the day, the deal that we had was that she would come to school. She would walk to school and pick me up and we would walk home together. And um, so I would finish school and she wasn't there yet. And I had just been in class for whatever, three hours or something. I'm five years old. I I super badly have to go pee. But mom said she was going to be there and she's not there. So I'm afraid because I already am dealing with separation anxiety. And so I'm afraid that if I leave to go pee, she's going to arrive. I'm not going to be there and she's going to go home without me. So I'm not going to leave the spot where we agreed to meet, but I got to go pee. And of course, you know, most days I just pee my pants. And so here I am five years old out in front of school. There's people coming and going. I've peed my pants. I'm humiliated because I peed my pants, but it's the only solution that I can come up with because I'm not going to leave that spot because if I leave that spot and she comes and leaves without me, catastrophic, I'm going to go into that same feeling of hysteria that I felt in the hospital when I was there by myself. And so it's, it's a situation that in and of itself, if the, 
if the three-year-old me and the trip to the hospital hadn't happened, then that situation would have been different and wouldn't have caused the same kind of trauma that it did when we have three-year-old me and five-year-old me and then consecutively throughout my life, more and more incidents piling on top of the first incident that are contributing to the separation anxiety and my reaction or how I interact with the world getting worse and worse and worse and worse until I'm a teenager and I start dating boys. And at any sign of them looking like they're going to leave this feeling of hysteria coming over me. And then my normal behavior of being actually a pretty fun person to hang around with all of a sudden, not fun at all to hang around with someone who's hysterical because someone's about to leave, or there's an idea that someone's about to leave, or there's a threat that someone's about to leave. And then later in my life, um, as an adult, this actually does become a threat. I end up in relationship with someone who regularly threatens to leave me as a way to have me engage more fully emotionally in the relationship with him because he feels like I don't have the capacity to engage with him the way that he wants me to. So he realizes that he can use this threat of leaving as a way to elicit strong emotion in me that gets me engaging with him in a way that he wants super unhealthy, super codependent, super bad place to be. <laughs> like my whole life, I've always chased after people who were never going to give me that approval. And I had never realized that it was because of my family. Because when I was a kid, like it was so bad that the children would also fight with each other. And at school, I had a relative, and I won't go into it too much, but she would make it a big thing. And she was the leader and would make it so bad that she would humiliate me in front of everyone. And I could never be accepted by her because there was a division in the family. But I had never realized the cause and effect of this. And it, it's such an interesting place to go because I think oftentimes as humans in, in this day and age, we're trying to figure out why our lives aren't working the way that we want them to, why we don't have as much joy or happiness or clarity or or whatever it is we're looking for. And it's a it's a fine line. Like we can go into this place of retrospection and um, self-inquiry and try and understand these things. But it's really easy for a lot of people to go there and then get stuck in a place of blame because this person did this to me this happened and now my life is ruined. But I think what we need to also bring to the conversation is the element of compassion. And what I mean is that I think it's important to understand that we all have this story. And when I say all, I don't just mean our generation. I don't mean our parents fucked us up. I mean, we all have our story. Every single human born onto this planet has the same story that's their own version. And now that I'm older, I also understand that the person in my family who did this had hurt that was passed down to them because if you're in a good place, you wouldn't treat people this way. Exactly. And that we've had that we've had so many generations of um trauma just because it's how we learn and it's the design the human design um that now we what if we actually want to heal that trauma we got to do the self-inquiry ask the hard questions um ask ourselves objectively promise to answer honestly go to that place with those answers and also have compassion for the people that came before us and understand just what you said like it's not, none of it is done on purpose. None of it is done with the understanding that it's going to hurt. It's going to cause trauma. It's going to make wounds. It's done because we don't know any different. And now is the time for us to start to understand uh, the impact of those types of behavior. And as we begin to understand the impact, then we begin to shift the behavior so that the wounds 
instead of having to heal the wounds, the wounds are just not being generated in the first place. I talk a lot about this with my parents because we're all on this little journey and I can understand when there's been so much hurt for so long. But I always say we need to have compassion and forgiveness and that it's not even necessarily for other people. And it's just very interesting to see how we like to hold on to the wound because this is something I've told you before, but the old me loves feeling sad. And I'm at the point where I've been doing this over and over and I think, what's wrong with me? I'm ready to move on. And then I've also been thinking about how you said that I need to be meeting myself where I'm at because When we do that, there's also the compassion part for ourselves. And this week, so many people told me, why do I keep doing this and getting really angry? But you're right. If we're not meeting ourselves where we're at, the getting angry at ourselves is just perpetuating that groove that we're stuck in. Mm -hmm. I like this, the saying, um, radical self-acceptance. I've heard that from a few different teachers before radical self-acceptance like take self-acceptance to a whole nother level and no matter what kind of crazy messed up stuff your brain is thinking about radically accept yourself the way you are right now which allows us that ability to meet ourselves here now where we are without being frustrated about where we are without being upset with that we're not further ahead in life or that we don't have our shit figured out even more or whatever it is like really just meet yourself here right now because this is where you can grow from so again because everyone talks about making our lives better This is the part where I want to give people concrete tips that they can use. And again, they might not necessarily be ready to hear it because I have friends that I tell them that they should be grateful for all the bad things. And they always tell me like, seriously, don't start with me. So whether it's radical self-acceptance or the part that talks about being grateful for the lessons, is there anything else that you think people should hear? Yeah. Um, I'm going to, just before I lose track of this, I just want to say the existential kink. So we did, I think we talked briefly about that. Um, Carolyn Elliott wrote a book called Existential Kink. And um, if you're the type of person that likes to read or listen to audio books, I would definitely recommend that uh, on this topic of, um, of not wanting to let go of our sadness or being unwilling to let go of a way of being that we're actually not that fond of. So she helps, she really helps to break down why we, why we hold on to those things and, and help us learn to see what we're getting out of it, what, how we're emotionally benefiting in a way almost from behaviors and and patterns and emotions that we don't actually like. And then back to the gratitude, the aspect of gratitude. I think I want to suggest that, that we look at the idea of perspective and that perspective is a choice, and that we can try on a perspective to see how it works. And then if it's not working out, we can take it off and we can try on a different perspective. And that's what I like to think about with gratitude. Um, I know sometimes it can feel like virtues are almost like a weakness or like a surrendering or like a giving up kind of thing. Oh, I'm not like strength is in raw. And if I'm kind, that's kind of like giving up on raw and settling for kindness. And what if we chose the perspective of kindness, tried it on for a little while and see what happens and see what the results are. And I think, I feel like that's a bit what it's like with the gratitude piece is that we don't really live in a society where true gratitude is really promoted. It's kind of a dog eat dog world, let's be honest. And so I think like actual true gratitude is a, a bit of an unfamiliar feeling. And maybe this is partly because when we're children, we're, we're made to say, thank you. You know, like our parents are like, oh, say thank you for that. And you're like, you know, say thank you for the super ugly sweater that Aunt Bessie gave me for for Christmas. I don't even really like it. And I have to say thank you, but I don't feel grateful. So we're not really taught 
I don't feel what true gratitude is. So when we try it on, it can feel super awkward. But what if we just picked it up as a perspective with a commitment to try it out for a little while and see how it goes? Because when we actually get a taste of what gratitude actually is, it's phenomenal. It's the experience of truly being grateful and finding a way to express that is, I don't know, I don't think there's anything else like that in the world. So what do we have to do to experience that? Okay, so I think it's one thing to, you know, someone cooks you a nice dinner and to say thank you and be grateful, feel grateful for that nice dinner. For me, the 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 deepest experiences of gratitude are when when I'm given a, a spiritual gift, not from another human being, but when I can see clearly that the universe is conspiring for my betterment. And I take a a minute to stop and like acknowledge that that thing just happened, that that gift was just given to me. I think recently for me, something that happens that I am super grateful for is I'll have a thought that let's say it's like, it's maybe not really a pleasant thought, or maybe it's, um, I'm being judgy of another person and my, the witness in me is active because it oftentimes is. So the witness is witnessing my brain doing this human typical kind of thing. And my brain realizes I'm being watched. I was just being rude. And the witness witnessed me being rude and me my higher self says, ah, how blessed I am to have had the life that I've had and the teachers that I've had who have brought me to the place where I can catch myself right in that thought, nip it in the bud, ask myself, is that the person that you want to be? Answer myself and say, no, it's not. Let's switch that train of thought. And the best part for me is that there is no shame there's no guilt, there's no rejection, there's no there's no feelings that are like, oh, you're a shitty human because you did that. There's an acceptance that I'm going through a process, that I'm blessed to have the ability to sit in the seat of the witness and catch myself in the act of being an asshole and remind myself, no, that's not who you are. Those are thoughts that come with having a brain. It's part of having a brain and we're going to move on. And for me, that's, that's magic. That's like, that's something worth being grateful for. And even the fact that I have come to the place where I can feel a sense of gratitude for that and recognize that that sense of gratitude is there and be grateful that I've been gifted with the ability to feel gratitude. That's fucking crazy. And feeling gratitude for the ability to be great, to even feel gratitude, like, I'm grateful that I have come to this place where my gratitude doesn't stop at thank you for making me a nice dinner, but it goes to the place of holy shit, thank you for my own personal evolution. Thank you for our collective evolution and thank you for my own personal evolution and thank you for giving me the ability to look at myself objectively and not go into a shame spiral or blame or whatever it is that comes up because being human is hard. And you're meeting yourself where you're at. And that's a really good lesson. And I think that the next time I hear someone saying, why am I repeating the same mistake over and over? I'll let them know that it's meeting themselves where they're at because you're actually aware that you're doing it, which is a pretty big thing in itself. And I think if we looked at all of the those things like when we say, okay, why do I do the same thing like dozens of times and continue to do it? I think if we were able to look at each incident through a microscope, we would see that each one is slightly different. There's a little shift, there's a little shift, there's, and it's so tiny that it's like almost not perceivable, but there is a shift that's happening and a change that's happening. And we are always moving towards greater harmony and greater balance. We just, we don't, ha- we just don't have the capacity to look at it on that minute of a level. But I think if we could, we would see that it's not exactly the same. I see it now before I do it because 
I'm telling someone, oh yes, I'll do this for you. And in my head, I'm actually saying, what are you doing? So before I would just have the resentment and not even be aware of when I was doing it. So it takes a lot of steps to correct things that have been going on for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And when you say a really, really long time, like not just this lifetime for you, like a really, really, really long time. These things have been passed down to us that we're just reliving from our ancestors. And so not only are you breaking down your own patterns, but you're breaking down historical patterns that that's why this stuff, this work takes time. It takes uh, perseverance. It takes commitment. It takes um, discomfort. <laughs> And resilience. And yeah, I guess the effort part too, because I often forget that it's supposed to be hard. And I guess I just have to write a list of sentences that I read at the start of each day where the first one will be, today will be hard. And I think that we we come to the place where things that would be construed as hard, again, it's the perspective thing. Like, we're we're trying on a perspective. So what if the circumstances were exactly the same, but the way I viewed the circumstances was different. And so I I have these exactly the same twin circumstances, but my perspective of this is that it's hard and my perspective of this is that I'm learning. And partly language, um partly choice, partly that the level of inner peace or our balance or equanimity that we have, um, you know, if we have 25% equanimity, things uh, feel exactly the same thing can feel a lot harder than if we have 75% equanimity. And so I think that maybe that conversation of perspective is, is a bigger conversation that needs a little bit more attention to just to dive in and, and really get a felt sense of what that means and not just the word perspective, but what does it feel like to try on different perspectives and see uh, how results can change. Thanks for listening. And if you take anything away from this conversation, please remember that progress is a very slow process. And even if you can't see it, it's happening. All you have to do is keep trying. We'd like to thank the Pretties for providing the music for the podcast. And until next time, please remember, kindness is contagious. (laughs) 